Good afternoon. This is Business Live with me, Ian King. We begin with some breaking news this hour on the collapsed retailer Wilco. Pepco, which is the parent company of Poundland, has agreed a deal to purchase up to 71 Wilco stores. It says these stores will be turned into Poundland shops. On completion, Pepco says it will prioritise recruitment for roles in these stores with existing Wilco workers. Let's get more on this from our business correspondent, Paul Kelso. I mean, this is a very vague statement, Paul. I mean, what's up to 71 mean? I mean, that could just mean six. It could mean one, it could mean 71, couldn't it, Ian? Uh, we understand uh, from speaking to Poundland that essentially well, I mean, they, what they have secured here is the right to approach the landlords individually of those 71 stores, up to 71 stores, they have in mind and begin this negotiations and they will reach a final number once that process is complete. The good news, if you work in one of the uh, Wilco stores that hasn't yet been closed. Remember, more closures began today after the collapse of Doug Putnam's uh, attempt to buy out um, the uh, the uh, the rescue deal yesterday. Is that Poundland is going to offer priority to existing Wilco staff at those stores? But it does seem there's quite a way to go. Uh, you're quite right to say before those jobs are saved and those stores remain open. But we are seeing uh, the bones of uh, the Wilco Empire and its 400 stores being picked over now. If all 71 uh, were to be uh, to go into come under Poundlands, that's 122 uh, by Sky News's calculation of the 400 odd Wilco stores that will have uh, secured life after Wilco. Um, but it remains to be seen quite how many of those come to fruition. Still a lot of jobs likely to go. The range, uh, Mark Klein and our colleague has been reporting, are in negotiations over the Wilco brand. So PwC, the administrators here, looking to extract as much value as they can from the collapse. Some hope if Poundland make good on this statement and open these stores under their own brand, that there won't be quite such a yawning gap on so many high streets uh, when Wilco finally ceases to be. OK, thanks, Paul. Now, Labour's deputy leader, Angela Rayner, has challenged unions to come together to support the Labour Party. Her call for unity follows recent criticism of the Labour leadership from the leaders of Unite and the PCS union. Angela Rayner told the TUC conference in Liverpool that the unions need to campaign together at the next election to ensure a Labour victory. The battle for the general election is getting started. And it's not going to be easy. But this country cannot survive another five years of Tory rule. Ask yourself, what will be left? There's no doubt that Labour has to win. But to get this victory, we have to come together, stand together and campaign side by side. And we need your help. Well, our chief political correspondent, John Craig, is in Liverpool and joins me now. John, I've seen some of her proposals for uh, changes to Labour legislation. Um, they don't seem like they're going to go down terribly well with employers. Well, they went down well with the uh, trade unions, I can tell you. Um, yes, there is a big programme of uh, employment law changes promised by Labour. And uh, Angela Rayner began her speech today by saying that uh, we'll bring forward an employment rights bill to legislate for what they call the New Deal for Working People in the first 100 days of entering office. And she said that is a cast-iron commitment. Now, that, of course, includes repealing the Conservatives' anti-strike laws, but there were an awful lot of other pledges as well. Um, a ban on zero-hour contracts, an end to fire and rehire, family-friendly working, she described it as, uh, a strengthening sick pay, uh, ending the gender pay gap, uh, tackling sexual harassment at work and then bringing in what she called a proper living wage. Now, she's been attacked uh, this afternoon by Greg Hans, the Conservative Party chairman, who has claimed that uh, Keir Starmer's uh, promise to, uh, uh, to be pro-business uh, has been undermined by Angela Rayner, as he put it, uh, uh, giving a commitment to the unions that uh, they will have more control over the economy. The mask has slipped, Mr Han said. That is slightly unfair, because Angela Rayner did say on relations uh, with the unions and business, uh, we will work hand in hand with trade unions as well as we will work as, as we will work with business too. So 
Labour is still talking about working with business, they say. But, of course, you're right. A lot of employers will not like uh, the uh, changes to uh, Tory legislation on strikes and so on. And a lot of the pay measures that uh, Angela Rayner was talking about, pay rises and so on, ending the gender pay gap and so on. Now, the rebuke uh, for the critics uh, was... Uh, well, that was uh, very much... Uh, uh, came at the end of the speech where she, she really got very serious about the election, the scale of the task facing Labour. We spoke to Sharon Graham afterwards, uh, who was pretty unrepentant and said, uh, I want Labour to be bolder. She said there must be no backtracking uh, on uh, employment rights. But to be fair to Angela Rayner, she couldn't really have been much clearer. It's a cast-iron commitment, she said, that they are going to legislate within 100 days of coming into office if they win the general election. Thanks, John. Some other business news stories for you now. And Shell has sold its remaining stake in the undeveloped Cambo oil and gas field in the west of Shetland region of the British North Sea. It sold its remaining 30% stake in the field for a reported 77.8 million US dollars to Ithaca Energy, the independent exploration and production company which is focused on the North Sea. It gives Ithaca full control of Cambo, which is the second largest undeveloped oil and gas discovery in the British North Sea. Shell said in December 2021 that it would not progress with the controversial project after coming under intense pressure from climate activists. Another FTSE 100 company is to switch its main stock market listing from London to New York as the paper and packaging group Smurfit Kappa confirmed today it is buying its US peer Westrock. The deal brings together Europe's largest paper and packaging business with the second largest packaging company in the United States. The combined business, which will be valued at $20 billion, will be headquartered in Dublin and will have its main stock market listing in New York. The news comes after the building materials business Ferguson relocated from London to New York and Flutter Entertainment, the owner of Paddy Power and Betfair, indicated it would make a similar move. We had a very big gap in our portfolio, so to speak, as we were not involved in the United States. And we've been looking over many years to figure out a way to get in there in a, at a way that would reward our shareholders over the long term. And uh, clearly, we've been talking with Restaurant for a period of time, and we've known the company for a long period of time. And we identified it as a, 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 an asset that we can develop with and combine with to be an even better asset. And so, you know, after a long series of negotiations, uh, we finally got to an agreement. The chief executive of Primark's parent company, Associated British Foods, today became the latest retailer to call on the authorities to tackle more, do, do more to tackle shoplifting. George Weston said Primark could raise spending on security guards, closed-circuit television and on equipping staff with body cameras to try to combat in-store theft. But echoing recent comments from Tesco and the John Lewis partnership, he added, we need to emphasise... Others have emphasised the role of the police, the Crown Prosecution Service and magistrates in tackling this problem, which is just getting steadily worse. They are doing more, but it's not enough yet. Well, still to come here on Business Live, we'll have a look at how the markets are doing this Tuesday afternoon. Don't go away. I'm Katie Spencer and I'm Sky News' arts and entertainment correspondent. When you think of Glastonbury, it's mud you want and music. They're going to cross to us live in a minute. Okay. Thank you so much. Brad Pitt is now a prolific producer behind the scenes. It's not a mystery to me. We always were capable of doing this. Oh, they're wonderful children as an audience. Who did that? A maverick here on the red carpet. I'm so excited, Hello, Tom Cruise. This is the story of the night. And it's the little independent film that could. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. Nor have I ever struck any woman in my life. There's this illusion of power. Are you feeling well? I remember covering the Oscars and that now infamous moment, the Will Smith slap. Nobody could quite believe that it's happened. 
you can tell from these crowds just how excited people are for the return of Clyde. These actors playing the lead roles were born long after the Sex Pistols broke up. Are you pleased that you did say yes to the job? I've never regretted it. As a team, we've interviewed some of the biggest stars in the world. It can be incredibly surreal being swept up in their world, but we try to give you an honest sense of how these people really are. OK, I'll talk to you. Don't leave me. Yeah, OK. <laughs> There's no easy goodies. There's no easy baddies. I've had a great time here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. The pound has rallied. The moderation interest rates peaking. I'm up at 6%. The highest for 14 years. Will that be the peak? Will it be a little bit lower? Crisis. It's closer to a potential crash. So many words, so many meanings. But what do they mean for you and your finances? Stay up to date on Sky News. It's like better. Fly Emirates, fly better. Thank you. Welcome back. The US defence giant Lockheed Martin has promised to create hundreds of new jobs in the UK if it's awarded a contract worth up to £1.2 billion from the Ministry of Defence to replace its ageing fleet of Puma helicopters. Lockheed expects to support at least 660 jobs for several decades by opening a line in Gosport in Hampshire to assemble the next generation of Sikorsky Black Hawk helicopters. But it's facing competition from both Airbus and the Italian defence contractor Leonardo, owner of the former Westland site at Yeovil in Somerset, who are joining now is Paul Livingstone, he's Chief Executive at Lockheed Martin UK. Paul, welcome to you. Apart from Gosport, where else do you think jobs might be created were you to win this contract? Well, we've got jobs scattered all over the country here. It's an area that we're very adept at doing. You'll know, of course, our F-35 Joint Strike Fighter programme, where we support over 21,000 jobs in the UK supply chain through delivering high-value jobs across a whole range of Tier 1, Tier 2 and Tier 3 subcontractors. So although Gosport will be the focus for our uh, new assembly line that we will build and assemble the Black Hawk helicopter here in the UK for the UK customer, we will see actually all across the uh, UK, Wales, the North East, the North West, the Midlands, there's a the South West, there's a huge range of companies that will become involved in this. 
they will also have the opportunity to be part of our supply chain, not just for the UK Black Hawk, but for the export Black Hawk as well. This is an airframe we've sold over 5,000 different versions of it around the world. We will continue to be building them for years, decades to come. It's a great opportunity for UK industry. Now, both Airbus and Leonardo are also promising to create jobs were they to win this contract. Why do you think you deserve to get the edge? Well, I think the reality is, whoever wins this, there will be jobs. There will be job creation or job sustainment. There will be skills for the UK. Nobody's planning to do this offshore and ship everything to the United Kingdom. So the difference becomes, what's the right helicopter? It can't just be about jobs. It can't just be about the politics. It's got to be about the right capability. This is the right capability of all the competitors. It is the only helicopter that's been designed specifically for military use. The others are commercial helicopters that have been adapted for military use. This is about not only taking young men and young women with the UK Armed Forces safely to the battlefield, it's about bringing them safely back home. Now, the MOD uh, has uh, just extended its contract with Airbus to maintain the existing Puma fleet for another three years. Does that have any implications, do you think, for this tender and when the contractor might come into existence? No, because I think, you know, we're still waiting, all of industry collectively are waiting for the release, uh, well, they call it an invitation to negotiate. So, if you like, the request for the proposal from the government, we're expecting that before the end of the year. They will then set out a competitive process and a timetable. So the idea, the idea that you would stop supporting the current program until you have the new program in place wouldn't really be credible. So for the sake of our armed forces, I'm absolutely pleased to see the Puma maintenance being extended to make sure that they've got capability in place until they bring that new system out. Do you know how many helicopters the MOD actually wants to buy? I mean, the tender document says it's 44, but the head of Airbus helicopters was recently quoted as saying he thought it could be between 25 and 34. I think the reality is there is a fixed budget and they will probably look for who can deliver the most capability within that budget envelope. 44 was in the draft tender documentation. As I said, we haven't seen the final tender from the government yet. When we get that out, we'll know exactly what they're looking for. But we're very excited and we feel we can provide within their budget the right level of solution that they'll be looking for. I was struck just now that you, you hinted that were you to win this contract, you might also uh, assemble helicopters for the export market as well. What, what proportion of what you do in the UK is currently exported? Well, it depends when you talk about Lockheed Martin's business or what Lockheed Martin spends in the UK. On an average year, we spend £1.6 <coughs> billion pounds in our UK supply chain. So if you take the F-35 programme, at the moment, the UK's brought 48 aircraft. They've declared they're going to buy up to 74, and they have a future of program of record of 138. We've delivered hundreds of aircraft, of which more than 15% has been built in the UK for every one of those aircraft. So another way to look at it is, if Lockheed Martin was a country, we'd be the fourth largest export customer for UK PLC. So. People export their products on Lockheed Martin platforms like the F-35 every single day of the week. And we're really proud of our UK supply chain and their ability to deliver high quality, high value skills, manufacturing and products to the UK. Sorry, it's really busy <laughs> at the show. OK, and very briefly, if you were please, Paul, put the UK into, into the context of Lockheed Martin's global uh, operations. I mean, you're a $105 billion company. Yeah, well, like I say, that's about, well, it's about one and a half to two billion, depends quite on the year that we turn over here in the UK. We spend 1.6 billion. We've got 1,600 jobs, actually direct LMUK employees that I have the honour to lead and be responsible for. But wider than that, we support over 21,000 jobs in the UK supply chain, of which 75% of that uh, supply chain are small and medium-sized enterprises. During COVID, we spent over a billion dollars 
in advance payments to the UK supply chain in order to make sure those small and medium-sized enterprises were protected. So for decades, the UK has been Lockheed's number one export market. It continues to be a major priority for us as a corporation, and I'm just very grateful to be part of the team that delivers that. All right, Paul, we have to leave you there. Thanks for joining me today, and well done for hearing me over all the noise there. It sounds very busy. Thanks so much, Ian. Have a good evening. Well, the oil price has hit a fresh 10-month high this afternoon after the storms in Libya forced the closure of four export terminals. Brent crude has gone above $92 a barrel for the first time since the 17th of November last year. You can see the price currently on the screen there, $92.06 a barrel. That's up more than 1.5% on the session. On the equity markets, well, it's been a mixed session in Europe. This is how the markets have finished there. The uh, DAX in Germany off half of 1%. Here in London, the FTSE 100, I can uh, just uh, show you that one, finished in positive territory, up uh, two-fifths of 1%. They're fairly broad-based rally. In percentage terms, the leading gainer was Associated British Foods. Mentioned them earlier in the programme. The Primark owner, of course, the shares finishing up 5.5% after it raised its full-year profits outlook for the second time in four months. The speciality chemicals group Croda is the leading faller. It's off one and a quarter percent on what looks to be a bit of director selling. Outside the FTSE, the financial services group JTC has finished up eight and a half percent on a well-received trading update. But the defence contractor Kemring has finished down seven percent. That's on news of a delay to one of its orders. Over on Wall Street, all of the main stock indices have opened to the downside. Lots of investors appear to be sitting on the sidelines ahead of tomorrow's US inflation data. Talking points this afternoon include the software giant Oracle. Its shares have fallen nearly 12%, and that is after its quarterly sales numbers came in below expectations. On the foreign exchange markets, well, Sterling's given back some of the gains it enjoyed against the US dollar yesterday. It's off a quarter of 1% against the greenback, more or less unchanged against the euro. The single currency off a fifth of 1% against the dollar. It's a good day for the dollar. Well, joining me this afternoon is Robert Olster. He's the Chief Investment Officer at Close Brothers Asset Management. Robert, great to see you this afternoon. Let's start with AB Foods. I mean, um, they're having a good few months here. Yeah, no, very good. Um, it sounded mixed when the numbers came out. Uh, Primark, you know, just around half of the business, um, doing very well. Um, some margin issues because of theft. Yeah. Um, the food business sort of turning around. But it was on the conference call the, the optimism of the management for next year in terms of Primark's growth, margins coming through, you've got cost reductions, of course, as energy falls back, etc. But just the overall confidence coming through both on Primark and in the foods business as well. And that, I think, was the result for the turnaround in the share price. Yeah, it's quite a few consumer-facing businesses reporting today. I mean, we yes. also heard from Wix. I met the management team there recently. They, they right. seem quite a lively bunch. Yeah, no, very much so. Um, Wix, very difficult market. You know what the UK housing market is like, both in terms of pricing, approvals and volumes. Wix sort of going slightly backwards, like for likes, but um, certain parts of its business doing well, the trade picking up, um, again, energy costs coming down. So it's a sort of good management team getting defeated a bit by bad markets. So we'll have to wait and see how 2024 pans out for them. And what about Fever Tree? This is a former stock market darling that's not quite as uh, in favour as it once was. No, I mean, Fever Tree is doing well in terms of the UK business, well, the US business is growing gangbusters, but that's a smaller part. In the UK, a far more mature business, there's competition coming in, it's, it's, it's a difficult market for them. The weather, of course, didn't really help in the last two or three months. Um, a lot depends on what you think is going to happen to the consumer going forward. And it's also an issue with Fever Tree about the rating. You know, the PE multiple at Fever Tree is very high. It's a go go growth stock and is rated as such. Now, another stock that's caught your eye this afternoon, Dow Lace, is obviously the old GKN automotive recently spun off from Melrose. Yes, exactly. And um, Dow Lace, what does it do? Well, it makes basically all the gears that transmit your engine power in your car to your wheels. So its great virtue is you have to have that, whether you've got an electric engine, a petrol or diesel. And Dow they had, you know, very good results. Um, surprisingly, the stock's off a bit. And I think that's because um, the United Auto Workers, Trade Union in the US, 
threatening strikes coming through. That affects three of um, Dowley's biggest competitors. So a bit of an unfair hit in that point of view. Yeah, this UAW uh, strike issue in the US is absolutely fascinating. I mean, they're threatening to bring out car workers in Ford, GM and in uh, Stellantis. Stellantis. First time ever. Yes, exactly. And that is going to have repercussions all the way through. I can't remember how many workers involved, but it's obviously tens, if not hundreds of thousands. And Stellantis, of course, making the Fiat brand. Yeah, now what about uh, Tesla? That's had a great rally last night on the, on the back of a broken note from Morgan Stanley. Yes, the Morgan Stanley note. So Tesla is now, as you know, is an auto company making electric cars, but Morgan Stanley have picked up on the fact that it's actually turning itself into an artificial intelligence company. So Dojo, it's sort of supercomputer that's collecting and analysing all the data from all the Teslas, so it's 5 million Teslas driving around, and they suddenly realise that this could actually be transformed not just for autos, but completely other industries, whether it's aerospace. So all of a sudden, the valuation of Tesla is getting reassessed, partly as an artificial intelligence company as a result. And it's very exciting, hence the share price jump. Yeah, I thought it was astonishing, Morgan Stanley comparing it almost with uh, Amazon Web Services. That's right, and that very high margin business as AWS is for Amazon. So, yeah, the... the total addressable market that they estimate um, for Dojo is sort of in the trillions. One to watch. Robert, always good to see you. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you. That's it from me. I'm back again with our morning edition at half past 11 tomorrow morning. We'll have the latest GDP figures, of course. Hope you can join me for that. In the meantime, do stay tuned. Coming up after this short break, it's the news hour with Mark Austin. Thanks for joining me today. Cheerio.